David Robinson is the Executive Director of the Canadian Association of University Teachers, representing more than 70,000 academic and general staff in over 120 universities and colleges across Canada. David took up the position on July 1st, 2014, after serving 15 years as the Association's Associate Executive Director for Research, Communications and International Relations. Prior to joining CAUT, David was the senior economist with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, Canada's leading progressive think tank. He has also been a lecturer at Simon Fraser University in Burnaby, British Columbia, and Carleton University in Ottawa, and is past president of Open Media. He is the author of a number of articles, reviews, and reports on higher education and research policy vocational education and training, and international trade and investment agreements. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you for having me. Now, the reason that I wanted to talk to you was because the eyes of the world are on Canada right now because of the review that's being undertaken by the government of the copyright policy. And I was puzzled because you represent 70,000 academics, many of whom are writers, and yet you don't agree with the Writers' Union of Canada and Canadian publishers on the policy. Why is that? Well, I think to, to try and unpack it a bit, um, you know, our members are academics who write academic articles and academic journals. Their principal motivation in doing so is to share knowledge with the world. Uh, you're not going to make a lot of money off of a technical research paper or an article in a journal. Uh, So very few of our members are actually authors with any financial prospects of making significant amount of of, uh, money. So their primary motivation is to share knowledge with the world. And that's why we're seeing some fundamental shifts in academic publishing towards open access platforms, open repositories, uh, open educational resources. And our members are leading that revolution. Okay, so they're more concerned with the public good, the public mm-hmm. public access yeah. to information than the rights of the creators of the work. Well, I, I think it's a bit more nuanced than that. I think uh, our, our members and, 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 and academics are, I think, in a relatively unique position where we're both heavy consumers or users of content, but also heavy producers. So I think from, from our perspective, what we want to make sure is we have an appropriate balance in copyright legislation that protects both creators, but also users. And that's where we saw following a series of Supreme Court cases beginning around 2008, the so-called copyright pentology, uh, reforms to the Copyright Act in 2012 that was trying to bring the law into line with the evolution in terms of how courts were interpreting user rights. And we saw the expansion or the explicit expansion of so-called fair dealing, what in the US is called fair use, uh, fair dealing provisions to the education sector, which essentially says that under certain terms and conditions, limited terms and conditions, you can make a copy of a work, again, under very strict restrictions, uh, without permission or without payment. Unfortunately, I think some people have interpreted that to mean, well, fair dealing must be free dealing, is that right. students are photocopying entire books and sharing them and professors are copying everything and that's not what fair dealing is supposed to be. Fair dealing is a portion of a work, for instance. So maybe... What portion? Yeah, it, it really varies and the Supreme Court was quite clear on this. It, it varies according to the context. So for instance, one article from an academic journal might be fair dealing. Uh, But again, it has to be for non-commercial purposes and it can't adversely affect the economic interests of the creator. One poem from a collection of poetry, but not the entire poem. An article from a newspaper, a clip from the evening newscast that someone can show in the classroom in a political science course or in a current affairs lecture or whatever. Uh, A portion of a film, but not the entire film. So it really depends upon the context and what the purpose is for and what alternatives there are. Uh, Because in many cases, there there are no alternatives for academics uh, except to make that one copy of the the newspaper article or to make that one copy uh, from the collection of poems.
Okay. So in 2012, as I understand it, the new copyright law added education to allowable purposes. For fair dealing. For fair dealing. Yeah. yeah. Along with uh, other elements, so parody and satire and public commentary, private study, and so on. But again, you know, that was, those decisions were made in order to bring the law into consistency with the decisions that the Supreme Court had made. Uh, So the Supreme Court had recognized that the Copyright Act, from its very inception, was always a balancing act. He yeah. was trying to balance... That's what Macaulay said way back in 17-whatever. Exactly. Yeah, yeah it's, it's to balance the interests of creators with the interests of users. Because, frankly, I think as a creator, you would want your work to be shared with people. Uh, how it's shared, under what conditions, is where the economic interests can come into play. And um, you want to say in whether or not it's shared. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. yeah. But the Copyright Act also recognized, again, very early on, that there were certain conditions in which uh, a user could make a copy. So under the old Copyright Act, every individual Canadian, if you bought a book, you had the right to make a personal copy for yourself. The whole book? The whole book. This was prior to 2012? This was prior to 2012. You're allowed to make one personal copy of something that you purchased. Uh, Where it became tricky is uh, with, uh, as we move to more electronic documentation, uh, so DVDs, you're yeah, theoretically yeah. allowed to make a copy of a DVD. Mm-hmm. And I know when my kids were younger, uh, we went through DVDs like mad because they would get fingers and scratches all over them. It would be nice if I could have made a backup copy, but we had circumvention devices that made it very difficult to make a copy that, that prevented it, even though that was your right under mm-hmm. the Copyright Act to make one personal backup copy. There weren't those protections for cassettes, because I remember that's right. <laughs> back in the, that's how old yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah, well, it's the technology, right? Or eight tracks, perhaps. Yeah. Right. Where no one's going to police if you make 10 copies of an anima to your friends, and they make 10 yeah, copies. Yeah, even though that's not consistent with the Copyright Act. Right. Uh, but the Copyright Act would have allowed you to make one personal copy of a cassette tape as a backup. Also, to translate it into a different format. So to take a audio recording on tape and put it onto a computer, for instance, mm-hmm. or into mm-hmm. a digital format, uh, you're allowed to do that as well. So specifically, what, as it pertains to education, what changed in 2012? Uh, I, you know, frankly, I would say nothing much really changed except the rules became codified in law. And what it allowed at that point is it woke up a number of institutions who who then thought about how does fair dealing apply uh, to our context now within the university setting. So many institutions set up and developed fair dealing guidelines to uh, educate students, to educate faculty about what's permissible under the Copyright Act Mm -hmm. in terms of what what constitutes fair dealing. And in so doing, several institutions also opted out of the collective licensing agreement with Access Copyright, arguing that they would prefer to license directly with individual publishers mm-hmm. and then use fair dealing uh, for other things. That Access Copyright is sort of a blanket license that covers everything. So even your fair dealing, which you should have a right to, uh, you theoretically uh, still pay for that through an access copyright license. And that also came on the heels of access copyright seeking before the Copyright Board a significant increase in the tariff charged on a per student basis. Uh, they were initially seeking a, a raise from about three or four dollars per student to about forty eight dollars per student. It was eventually reduced a, a bit more. But a number of, of institutions twenty six dollars, right? Yeah, yeah. But a number of institutions really bristled at that, mm-hmm. thinking, why are we paying more to access copyright when we're not when we have when we have more open access materials, more open educational resources, and we have fair dealing, uh, it doesn't make sense for us to be paying access copyright the same level, and in this case, significant more, in terms of access to materials that should be already available and is your right. Okay. So the problem right now is that book publishers and authors mm-hmm. believe that fair dealing is being abused by users. Mm-hmm. Is it or isn't it? Well, uh, you know, I, th- I think the jury's out on that. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to say that there's not people uh, 
uh, generally who are abusing uh, copyright rules in an electronic environment it makes it's much more easier to uh, copy and disseminate um, materials than it was before but I can tell you that institutions have very clear uh, fair dealing principles and guidelines in place that uh, students and faculty have to have to adhere to uh, the onus is on the publishers, I think, if there's concerns that, that there's some kind of free dealing going on, mm -hmm. then let's let's find out. Uh, but I don't think that's that's largely the case. Uh, I think in in most institutions there are very clear sets of fair dealing guidelines. Uh, university librarians, who are big champions of fair dealing principles, work very closely with faculty and students to educate them on what's what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, and what's illegal. Those practices, I think, are generally adhered to for the for for the most part. Uh, I think the issue, you know, that the publishers raise and the writers a, too, and 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 some writers. I mean, I think I think there's some difference of opinion amongst writers. Okay. And uh, we saw before the uh, uh, the industry hearings uh, about yeah. the Copyright Act, there were a number of uh, poets who came forward and and said we're in favor of fair dealing. Uh, because, you know, frankly, there is no econo sound economic model for the production of poetry in Canada. But there are, you're, I think there's a critical mistake being made, is that individuals are blaming fair dealing for all the woes in the publishing sector. Hmm. Some publishers are doing very well. Uh, if you look at the academic sector, Elsevier, Springer, academic publishers have profit margins that are superior to Google and Facebook. Uh, but some academic publishers, some other academic publishers, small Canadian publishers, are doing very badly. The reality is they were doing, they were struggling before the Copyright Act was changed as well. Mm -hmm. I think the, the critical issue is the publishing industry, like the music industry before it, the movie industry as well, is going through a fundamental transformation. To because it's what, easier to access digital now? It's e much more materials are being uh, provided in digital formats. Alternative formats, uh, audiobooks. <laughs> There's all kinds of different things happening that happened in the music industry, that happened in the uh, in the uh, in the film industry as well. And I think publishers have to recognize that the ground is shifting beneath them. Mm -hmm. I think authors also have to recognize, and authors may want to look at some of the practices and innovations that musicians have engaged in to directly retail their work to uh, to the public or to make things openly available and ask for contributions. Uh, we also, I think, need to look at potentially subsidies, uh, to, particularly for uh, works that don't enjoy the same kind of mass audience that other works do. So I think there's a whole number of things that we have to, uh, have to unpack, but I, if you look at some of the big textbook companies like Nelson and uh, Pearson that have scaled back their production, uh, in every case, they were scaling back production before 2012. And they were scaling back because they recognized there's more open educational resources uh, that are affecting the marketplace. British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, the governments now publicly subsidize an open education textbook or an open textbook format for public school students. Uh, that's a significant market. Uh, but that's the wave of the future, I think. And, and this, uh, sorry, this open text book is, is what? Basically material that the authors have said, sure, you yeah. can use this, so you don't yeah, through, have to pay anything for it. Yeah, through a Creative Commons license or, or, the, or the choice to make something open access. I think what's happening in the academic publishing sector now is eventually going to hit other publishers at some point, and that is more and more authors wanting to make things open access, uh, wanting to share their, their materials. Uh, so I think it's a fundamental shift in the way the industry is managed, and the economic model of the old days I don't think is going to hold much longer and we need to find alternative economic models to support a thriving uh, publishing sector but also to deal with I think a, a ongoing problem and that has been the relative uh, paucity of resources and money going to creators mm -hmm. uh, you know aside from a few big name authors it's very difficult if not impossible to make a living in Canada as as a poet or as an author well, that's a, that's a good uh, entree here to a, a quote that I'm going to read from John Deacon, mm -hmm. uh, who is the head of the Writers' Union of Canada, and this is what he said in front of this, that standing committee on industry, science, and technology. 
We now know that the 2012 imposition of education as a category of fair dealing has delivered none of its intended benefits and has caused exactly the kind of economic damages many of us predicted. Students now pay more for their education. Teachers are less able to legally access works and are much more likely to end up in court. Meanwhile, those who provide the work education copies, Canada's writers, yeah, the work that education mm -hmm. copies, uh, Canada's writers have suffered a disastrous income decline. Fully 80% of our licensing income has simply disappeared because schools now copy for free what they used to pay for. These are facts that may be ignored by some, but they're indisputable. So you're going to dispute them? <laughs> I will take <laughs> issue with them, absolutely. Um, you know, I, there's, there's a lot to, to unpack there, but I think the very first thing is it would be, I think, an interesting thought experiment to walk into a university library and search out uh, nonfiction works. Only in a typical university library, less than 5% of the collection is nonfiction work. Of that, sorry, what's that? Only... only less than 5% would be non or sorry, fiction. The other I, way I, I that's what I thought. So, yeah, yeah. Would, would, would be work of, of uh, fiction. Right. 95% is nonfiction. Of that 5% of fiction that's in a university collection, less than 1% is Canadian. So to say that this has had an enormous impact on the livelihood of Canadian authors simply ignores the fact that most universities don't buy a lot of Canadian authors to begin with. Okay. So that's, that's, that's the first point. Uh, I think the other point has been that the decline in, in revenues going through access copyright is driven not by fair dealing, but it's driven by different modes of delivery, precisely through open access, through open educational resources. That's what's been shifting uh, away from uh, the access copyright license and Nelson Canada, Pearson Canada, they both admitted that when they, when they scaled back production of their, of their physical copies of textbooks. Those two companies, interestingly enough, have been putting more money into electronic versions of textbooks yeah. uh, and have been scaling back on the, on the uh, physical ones. Okay. So I think that's, that's, that's part of the, uh, of, of the issue as well. Sorry, let's get, can, you, can you just quickly give me a thumbnail sketch of, of access copyright? Sure, That's access a collective is it of uh, access Canadian? copyright is a collective of publishers and authors. In fact, uh, CAUT all Canadian or it's all the world. It's all Canadian mostly, um, although some of the publishers have their foot in two countries. Uh, and actually, CAUT was a founding member of Access Copyright uh, at, uh, at one point. So you withdrew. No, we're still a member, uh, but, and, uh, and a lot of our members still receive their royalty checks, but the average royalty check going to an author in Canada from Access Copyright is around $200 a year. It's not a huge amount of money uh, to, to begin with. So I, again, I think the issue is, with all due respect to the Writers' Union, is the economic model of publishing is fundamentally shifting, mm. and these are all symptoms of it. Uh, it's easy to blame fair dealing, but fair dealing isn't the problem. <laughs> there are deeper underlying problems that have to be addressed in publishing. We need to find ways to make the work of creators, uh, to, to make the, the life of the author something that can be livable. And that's where I think we need to look at what kind of other models are necessary. Do we need some more aggressive kinds of public subsidies to help authors create work. Clearly, it always has to. I mean, it always goes back to the government forking out more money, though. Well, it's. I'm not sure how else. I mean, that's just one idea. I'm not sure how else we could do it. I mean, what, it, what other ideas? Well, in there? in the publishing sector, or sorry, in the in the in the music sector, we see a lot of musicians now offering their music online for free and asking for contributions. Plus they go on tour, of course. Plus they go on tour and so on. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, that may work when you have a big mass audience. Yeah. But, but again, how do you deal with... Poetry I mean, doesn't I, have a mass audience. Yeah, and I, and I come back to poetry again. Poetry is something that's vitally important. It's for the common good. But almost every publisher will tell you that a collection yeah. of poetry... Yeah, it loses money. It loses money. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, how, how do we shift from a, a market-based approach... To publishing to maybe something different. I don't know the answer to that yet, but I think that's a conversation we should be having. How come then 
the rest of the publishing uh, world outside of Canada is uh, really nervous about the Canadian model being adopted in other countries. If it doesn't affect their income, why are they concerned? Uh, it's a great question, and I don't know the answer to that, but I think some of it has been, uh, frankly, there's been a lot of misinformation coming out of Canada about the impact of fair dealing, and we've already discussed some of that. Essentially, what we have in Canada now with our fair dealing principles brings us in line, and in fact, some people would argue we're still not quite up to speed with fair use principles in the United States. Yeah, they're they're kind of uh, even further along yeah. than we are. And you don't that. hear the United mm -hmm. States complain that... Uh, you know, fair use has been the demise of the publishing industry in the United States. Uh, the European Union is going through the process right now of updating its copyright uh, provisions and is looking at broader exemptions uh, for, for the education sector. And again, people there are saying, well, look at the Canadian example. But in many cases, like the UK also has a very robust fair dealing principle. They I thought, I thought they, were, they were tighter than, uh, than Canada is. Uh, there, Quite a bit. In, in, in some ways, but our, our legislation is very similar in terms of, of, of recognition of fair dealing. Um, and other jurisdictions are also looking at the same as well. At the international level, through the World Intellectual Property Office, there's a real push from developing countries in particular for allowing for greater exceptions for education and research purposes in the spirit of development. Because in many cases there, the issue is getting access to materials. Now that they're available on the internet, it's much easier to download, copy, and share with, with students in a classroom or in a university or faculty. And they're, they're looking for uh, ways in which there can be recognition of use for education purposes, how that would work in terms of an economic model. So there's all kinds of interesting discussions happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's really the countries, oddly enough, it's Canada, the United States, and the European Union who are trying to block that <laughs> because they're home to some of the bigger publishers, of course. And why are they trying to block it? Well, I think, uh, you know, potentially, I think publishers are still locked into this uh, traditional economic model of publishing. And are afraid that it might uh, it might it might impact on their on their revenue streams. But again, I don't think that's that's the, that's the main problem. I think the whole notion of publishing is shifting dramatically, and I think it's actually shifting for the better. Uh, but I think we all we all need to come together and figure out a way forward, rather than engage in what I think are very disingenuous arguments about all the problems in the publishing sector, all the problems facing authors can be laid at the feet of fair, fair dealing. I think that's just demonstrably false. Hmm. Well, what about uh, these uh, sort of course packs? Mm -hmm. And uh, again, this is uh, John uh, Deegan, yeah. He's saying that students are actually paying more because of administration costs to police fair dealing. I have no idea where he's coming up with that, but uh, that may be an anecdotal piece. I have no idea. Uh, a lot of the course packs are, you know, are increasingly using open access material. Sorry, no, I'm mixing those two up. The, the administration costs yeah. to police fair dealing, that's right. one thing. But these course packs apparently are taking material that money should be, some copyright right. money should be paid, but it's right. not being paid. Uh, again, it depends on on the context. We'd have to look at each individual course pack and decide whether or yeah. not it conforms to uh, to fair dealing or not. And what he's saying is that the, all the administration that goes into determining that kind of stuff yeah. is actually costing ultimately, I guess, the student yeah, more I, than what you would pay if you if the, a new or uh, revised copyright act gave permission for a collective a, a collective license to be uh, sort of levied against uh, students or yeah. uh, educational institutions. I, I couldn't imagine how that would cost more. There may be, what, what he may be referring to is that in, in the process of first developing fair dealing guidelines and until we get going, there may be some initial uh, extra administrative cost, but I think once once the system's in, in place, it runs fairly smoothly and efficiently. 
What about, speaking of courts, what about the, the fact that uh, York University has just lost a court dispute about mm-hmm. fair dealing? Right. Yeah, that, and actually there was an appeal of that decision held just this past week in Ottawa. And uh, what, the Federal Court of Appeal, we won't hear from, from the appeal at that point. Uh, you know, there were, in our estimation, in, in the original case, and the dispute there was access copyright felt that uh, York University's guidelines on unfair dealing weren't appropriate and weren't consistent with what the courts had, had determined. And well, that, yeah, well, but that's the thing, is that the courts haven't put in, like, it, it can only be 10% of the right. work. It's yeah. vague, right? That's right. I yeah. suppose what they want is clarity. I, I suppose what they want is some clarity, but it's hard to be clear when everything's contextual. <laughs> when you have to look at the context of each piece in which you're you're uh, you're engaging in fair dealing. So fair dealing a small portion of a large book is very different than fair dealing three chapters out of a five chapter collection. Uh, mm. So each context is is going to be a little bit that, different. And I think that's why they're saying the administration of it. Yeah. Yeah. John might be saying that that's. More ultimately, more expensive for the uh, student than than yeah, imposing it. Uh, I don't see how because the the administration is essentially here are the guidelines, and then if professors have have questions, they can talk to their university librarians or the administrative person in charge of fair dealings, usually out of the library, who provides some expert guidance on that. And that's not going to impose a huge uh, cost burden on the institution. That's why, in fact, I think it's why institutions are looking at this is because of the cost burden imposed by the collective licensing arrangements. Mm. But I think in the in going back to uh, the York case, there were some specific questions that had to be dealt with. That, like what? Uh, well, there were, there were questions about whether the fair dealing guidelines were actually appropriate uh, and whether uh, York was uh, sufficiently monitoring what faculty and students were uh, doing. So there were a number of questions that, that Access Copyright was uh, raising. Uh, the judge in the initial decision came out and determined that, in his estimation, uh, York did not provide sufficient guidelines in terms of fair dealing. We disagree fundamentally with uh, with that decision. We think there were some errors uh, in law on that. It was as if the uh, judge had not read the Copyright Pentology Supreme Court cases. Uh, so a so long- the judge is at fault here. That individual judge. I think were errors in law, yes, and uh, that's why we joined as an intervener in the appeal process, and we expect this appeal will likely go to the Supreme Court again. The Supreme Court will make another decision on fair dealing. So it's going to be. How long is that going to take? Oh, these things take they take some time. Like <laughs> they take what? several years. Several but, years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but uh, uh, I'm fairly confident that uh, the courts will at least recognize that uh, there were some significant. Uh, errors in understanding fair dealing on the part of the judge. Uh, the facts of the, of the case uh, will have to be uh, looked at uh, more carefully, but I do think that uh, uh, at the end of the day, the uh, pendulum is swinging, certainly in the, in the court's minds, uh, towards broader notions of fair dealing than what existed in the past. Uh, in the past, you know, we used to joke that prior to the copyright pentology, the right that a professor might have was maybe to write something on a dry erase board and erase it afterwards. <laughs> uh, so I think we need to make sure we don't go back to that very restrictive environment where it was very difficult to introduce or share material for educational, pedagogical, research purposes. What about the sanctions for violation? They're, they don't, they're, they're quite weak, aren't they? Like, what are they? Uh, the sanctions for violation, well, it, it's potentially you expose yourself to uh, to legal claims of violation of copyright. Uh, the uh, Copyright Act provides for uh, for uh, various enforcement mechanisms. They can be very high high levels of fines. What's interesting is, you know, the courts have gone back back and forth on this. You might recall when uh, the U.S. brought in the Digital Copyright Millennium Act under the Clinton administration. This was to deal with copyright in a digital age. And we had all kinds of cases of someone who had a MySpace page, if you can remember back that far, and had a <laughs> link didn't go too far, <laughs> right. yeah. and had a link to an audio file of of the latest, you know, hit song or whatever. Uh, said, "Welcome to my page," and the music would be playing. They were being sued for millions of dollars by the record industry, saying mm-hmm. you're violating copyright. Mm-hmm. And under the Digital Copyright Millennium Act, the the fines were quite heavy. Uh, even for something as innocent as that, which was very different than, say, someone who was burning CDs in their basement and selling them on a street corner and having a significant economic impact on the uh, publisher. So the courts in, in Canada and Canadian legislators have tried to, to levy fines and penalties uh, 
that would be consistent with the, the level of uh, violation and the impact it would have. So an individual who, you know, pirated a song only for their own personal use or shared it amongst a small group of friends and didn't ask money for it would be treated differently than, than the real pirates out there who are pirating materials and trying to sell it and make money off of it. This is kind of uh, the topic of my podcast and focus of my mission is, the, is focusing in on the book, but mm. I can't help but ask the question about like, you can get all the music you want off mm. YouTube for free. Yeah. And what's that all about? Yeah, that's a well. That's that, that's a U.S. based platform. So I, I don't know about that. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a whole different thing. But you know, perhaps we'll get. Uh, we did have an issue, as, as you might recall, a number of years ago when Google was trying to digitize books. There was the Google Books yeah. uh, platform, and there was a case in the U.S. about that. And Google tried to argue that it was engaging in, in fair use. Uh, it got slapped down a little bit, uh, but there still are uh, a number of books that are in the public domain now. Uh, that the copyright term has expired, that are now available freely on the internet as well, mm -hmm. and that's you know that's that's, that's one the of the Guggenheim project, or no, no, the Gutenberg. Yeah, project. that's right. Yeah. yeah, and I think you know that's also one of the things we have to keep in mind in in the context of this discussion is one of the things that came out of left field during the review of the Copyright Act is you may have heard the United States elected Donald Trump president. I know. That may be news for, to some, shocking, but... Uh, I can't think of anything that doesn't <laughs> <That's right. laughs> But uh, uh, one of the things that the Trump administration did was they promised and eventually did renegotiate NAFTA. And the new U.S.-Canada-Mexico Free Trade Agreement now raises copyright term by 20 years. From 50 to 70? From 50 to 70. So now... Uh, a lot of work that would have come into the public domain is not going to be in the public domain. So we think this also, you know, that was through NAFTA. That was through the revised U.S. Canada Mexico trade agreement. Yeah. <laughs> so we're we're moving to a seventy year term now, and we also got to figure that into this discussion about fair dealing and, and, and fair use. And that was a gift to the publishers. Uh, so let's make sure we keep it balanced as we move forward. Just uh, winding down here, as I say. Uh, uh, I want uh, in the future to have a plentiful supply of beautiful books, uh, beautiful books, books as objects, but also important, great works. And there's an argument coming from the other side that, uh, that this is threatened. Well, I don't think it's threatened by fair dealing. Books may may not exist in the form they do now. I don't know. I can't predict the future. I doubt it. I think there will always be room for physical books. But I think the key issue is how do we find an economic model that makes that sustainable? Because right now, if we try and dig in our heels and stick to a model that is demonstrably being shown to not work, and maybe those that, books aren't going to exist. It's not working because publishers have been facing difficulty for 20 years in Canada. As the shift to, to different kinds of formats and different kinds of medium uh, take place, it may not make economic sense to produce books in the way that we used to, or at least some books. You know, There's always going to be the Harry Potters and so on that are big sellers and make people millions of dollars, but most authors don't come anywhere near that. Uh, so I guess what I'm saying is let's not debate about fair dealing, that's not the issue. Mm -hmm. The issue is the economic infrastructure, the economic base of the publishing sector is shifting. And we have to decide, are we going to try and hang on? Or are we going to look for solid, more solid footing in a different model? And again, I don't know what that model is, uh, but I think that's a conversation that's worth having. So you don't think that fair dealing has had a detrimental effect on Canadian writers and Canadian publishers since 2012? No, absolutely not. There's, there's no evidence to support that whatsoever. If the Copyright Act in 2012 had not changed a thing, we'd still be having a conversation, but we'd be blaming something else. It wouldn't be fair dealing. Uh, fair dealing is not, not, not the issue. Uh, again, you know, this is a symptom of a longer term trend. Uh, and uh, a deeper problem. Uh, that's, it's true that some publishers are really struggling, but I also point out that some publishers are doing very well. So it's not, it's not even, and it's something 
that we need to figure out how can authors get a better deal from their publishers, which I think has been a long-term problem. Uh, in certain but that's, Canada, that's between the, the, uh, the publisher and the author. That's, yes, yes. That, that doesn't have anything to do with our conversation, really. Well, but I think that's one of the reasons why... It's just why, that they're splitting small... They're saying they're splitting smaller yeah, spoils. Yeah, but I also think it's, it's in the context of authors blaming, diminishing returns on fair dealing. I don't think it's all because of fair dealing. I think some of the publishers are, are not... They're uh, taking a bigger ad- Adequately percentage. compensating. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. Just finally, I, I've seen this reference to this number of 600 million pages mm-hmm. copied. Uh, I, I assume that's annually. That's a, that's a hell of a lot of copy. That's in the context of all the education sector? I think so, yeah. Yeah, where does the number come from? I don't know. Yeah. I should I should have uh, sourced it, but, but I've seen it in no, a number of different places. Yeah, but it's certainly possible. But but again, you know, when, when you come... How do you, how do you count that, though? Like, I how do you know? Well, I'm sure there's some people who do samples and uh, try and figure out uh, mm-hmm. yeah. how, and, and extrapolate from that. But mm-hmm. again... You know, when you look at what's being copied and shared in the university environment, it's not poetry or Margaret Atwood, it's technical papers. It's things that may be already open access, that someone's printing off copies for their students or for their colleagues or personal copies for themselves. It's journal articles. Uh, it, almost all the fair dealing, I would say well over 95% of the fair dealing uh, in the education, in the higher education sector is in academic publishing, academic journals, uh, technical papers, things that if they're read by 20 people, uh, they're considered a success. Well, thank you for uh, defending uh, fair dealing so eloquently, and I look forward to getting the diametrically opposed position from (laughs) someone in the publishing industry. Well, I'm sure you will, and that'll be interesting. (laughs) Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. I've been speaking to David Robinson, who is the executive director of the Canadian Association of University Teachers, uh, located in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Thanks again. Thank you.